Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rosemary and uh, thank you for joining us for our second edition of the Hematopathology Community of Interest and welcome to those that are joining us from, for the first time. Um, just as a quick uh, reminder for, for our new participants, um, this is a community of interest that we've um, started because we felt there was a need to have a forum where we're all pathologists and clinical scientists that are interested in hematopathology can meet the share interesting cases, um, discuss some challenges that we encounter in our practices, and just exchange uh, knowledge in a friendly, sort of informal and collegial uh, manner. And uh, today we're, uh, we're doing this slightly differently from last time in terms of the format. Well, given the recent publications in blood and uh, leukemia, we felt that it was timely to have uh, Hubert and Jose Mario come and um, just discuss uh, the implications uh, of these two publications on our practice and engage in, in, um, in interesting discussions. And then we will have a few case presentations. And uh, as last time, we will um, put a uh, the post meeting uh, survey uh, in the chat, and we encourage you to fill out the survey to and provide feedback so that we can uh, improve uh, further uh, these meetings. So I'll just let uh, Hubert, who is a hematopathologist at Sunnybrook, and Jose Mario, who is a clinical molecular geneticist and staff scientist at UHN, uh, get on with their presentation. Thank you, Rosemary, and welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. I see we have a lot of participants. I only recognize a handful of names, so fortunately, we won't have time to do some, some introductions. Uh, but I welcome you all here, and I hope that you'll find the talk uh, to be interesting, and I hope to actually hear from you live in, in, in this session. So first off, let's, hope we, let's make sure I can advance this properly. <laughs> So for this community of interest uh, general theme, I think one of the priorities for me is really to promote conversation, especially in a forum like today, where you know I see a lot of names I don't even recognize, but that when we say we're a community of interest, what I think, you know, we are a community and we're a very diverse community. And the first thing I wanted to recognize was the fact that, you know, we're, we're hematopathologists, so we have an interest in hematopathology. Uh, we come from very diverse training backgrounds, and some of us on this call may be from academic centers, some of us may be from community centers. Some of us may work at a complex malignant hematology center that has acute leukemias and transplants. Some of us may not be a CMH center, or some may be on the cusp of becoming a CMH center, or that the center that you work in has plans for becoming one of these CMH satellites. We also come from different educational backgrounds and experiences, and these could be Canadian hematopathology, uh, AP, CP, HP, uh, general general pathology, HP, or maybe you're just here today because you just like like HP, even if you've never had any formal training. My counterpart for today is Jose Mario, and I, you know, I think the topic about WHO and ICC is very uh, prudent and involves our uh, genomic specialist teams, whether they be molecular cytogenetics or staff scientists. Sorry for the typo down there, and that one of the big things is going to be oh which one do I use? And I'm not gonna answer that for you today about which exact classification you're gonna use. But the fact that as we're all part of a team taking care of patients and that there's gonna be crosstalk required between us on the lab uh, medicine side as lab medicine professionals, and then with the clinical treating partners, whether these be hematologists or even medical oncologists. So first off, this present, this presentation is not a line by line review of WHO versus ICC classification systems. So if that's what you are expecting, um, you can get two hours of your life back because uh, that's not what we're gonna be talking about. So part of the reason I decided that, you know what, I wasn't gonna do that for this talk, first of all, was that the WHO is still only published in beta version. So even if it's near finalized, we don't know exactly if there's some, any other changes, but if you have the money to spare, you can pay hundred euros and you can read the beta version for one year, just for one year. Um, so I'd like to say that even from some CCO work, we've decided to put a pause on some of some guidelines, just wait for the formal WHO to be released before making any uh, more formal uh, announcements about anything. A line by line kind of comparison in terms of diagnostic criteria between WHO and ICC and comparing it to the 2016 or 2017 version 
uh, I want to say was recently discussed at the National Heme Path Distributed Academic Half Day Program organized by UBC. So certainly in follow-ups, if you've never even heard of that or something that, oh, you know what, I would have liked to participate in that as well, uh, please let Rosemary know and we can always connect you to the broader national uh, Heme Path community as well. So, and then finally, I'm sure there'll be endless meetings talking about WHO versus ICC and that it's a great excuse to like find a conference in Hawaii and go listen to that on a beach instead of on Zoom uh, this Friday. So I was introduced by Rosemary that we have a fancy new built-in poll in Zoom. So let's see if it works. Can we try the poll? Should be okay. Working. Do yep. you prefer, based on whatever knowledge you know right now, the WHO version or do you like the ICC? Okay, so good enough for now. Thank you for participating. I think we have half the people on the call uh, clicking. Are you able to see the poll results actually? I can't tell. Yeah, you should be seeing it. Okay, so we have a, a huge majority uh, favoring the WHO classification over the ICC. And that's actually uh, interesting. Um, I It was a smaller poll. I didn't have the fancy uh, uh, poll app on, on the zoom earlier this earlier a few months ago in the summer when i did also talk up specifically to a, an acute leukemia crowd uh, by the way uh, in joint uhn sunnybrook rounds at the beginning before i said anything everyone favored who but by the end of the talk it actually reversed and more people favored the icc classification so i think depending on which talk you go to and if someone already has an inherent bias in terms of which classification system they prefer like which faction you belong to then they may sway, sway you in, in one way or the other. I think we're all familiar that, you know, we've got to this point, you know, using the WHO system, 2001, 2008, 2017, it was great, it was useful, it was scientifically accurate. There was a lot of time lag, unfortunately, in between versions. And obviously there was a lot of research and technology change over that time. The production of these versions, however, heavily involved the Society of Canadopathology, SH and the EAHP. And for many different reasons, that I'm again, not going into today, uh, things broke apart and we've ended up with two classifications right now. You can find the uh, formal published versions now uh, in blood and then in leukemia uh, or ICC on the left and the WHO on the right. The higher impact journal is technically blood if you're, if you're into that kind of thing. And, you know, and the other one is officially sanctioned by the American Society of, Hemato uh, of Hematology. If you want to read about the background of how we got here, there's a couple of interesting editorials. Uh, here's one, again, um, you might be able to look up the link uh, afterwards uh, from my slide deck. And then some uh, letters to the editor from the ICC team back to the WHO, the very terse. In my opinion, that's just too bad, so sad. This is like water under the bridge now. So if we're gonna talk WHO ICC specifically about myeloid classification, there's a big purple elephant in the room, particularly where I practice. So I don't know where everyone practices. Uh, I assume most of you may be from Ontario and I assume maybe most of you may be from the GTA, but I'm not 100% sure. But what I do know based on my experience is that you need myeloid NGS for application of the WHO or the ICC system, but this is not routinely accessible. I know that for myself in my practice and for some of my colleagues in, in the Toronto area, that the only time we'd run myeloid NGS is for that very first diagnosis of AML, but the exception of the London area, I don't know if we have anyone uh, from London right now, uh, and a subgroup of patients that get referred to the uh, MPN uh, clinical group at Princess Margaret. So London has done something different for their catchment area, and then additional clinical NGS is done for subsets of MPN patients uh, supported by Princess Margaret supported by your lottery tickets, really. Okay. So what are we talking about today? That I really want to engage in some discussion about the logistical challenges and the practical implications of trying to apply this right now when we don't actually have access to myeloid NGS, but we are very hopeful that that may change in the near future, maybe as soon as next year. I have my fingers crossed, but again, even if that were to happen next year, we'd like to have some understanding, well, how are we gonna just flip the switch? How are we actually gonna use it? Who's gonna order it? And along that kind of theme to discuss a few things that I've been thinking about here at Sunnybrook 
about triaging, about what samples are we going to do NGS on, what are the indications we will use it for, will you repeat it over and over again, and who, how are you going to integrate really this final report. So if anyone has any questions, just feel free to, to speak up at any time or use the uh, raise your hand uh, emoji. So at the end of this talk, I'm hoping you'll feel like, okay, you know what, this is how I'm going to take the WHO ICC. I'm going to take it like this hamburger. And there's going to be a triage component to using this genomic uh, tool. Then we're going to have all this genomic good stuff that Jose Mario is going to talk about, which is going to be the, the juicy part in the middle. And then we're going to have that integrated uh, report that captures everything. And to spice it up, your role is that we're going to increase the flavor by adding some team pass sauce on the top and on the bottom. So my perspectives today have been guided from being at UHN first as an acute leukemia center, and then having the luxury of actually basically every test, most of the tests you want at your fingertips, to uh, working at Sunnybrook and helping start a new, a new acute leukemia referral center that's actually reliant on external genomics uh, support with very limited uh, internal genomics menu. I've also seen the power of myeloid NGS and again, the importance of three specialties working together, which is our clinicians, our hematopathologists, and our molecular scientists, which you know all three of us work together to get to the right diagnosis and management plan for MPN patients, for example. And I've been trying to use these perspectives to also help advise for Ontario, how are we gonna roll out, first of all, fun myeloid NGS, and how are we gonna use it in, uh, in the broader kind of CMH uh, umbrella? And then lastly, um, to also see how basically a lot of other provinces, this is not, this is already not an issue because they've been doing it for quite some time. So I've alluded to London being uh, an outlier so far, really kind of blazing ahead in terms of myeloid NGS access. We know that right now our CCO, Cancer Care Ontario, only funds myeloid NGS for their first time diagnosis of AML. So, is any, are there any brave souls here from, say, outside the GTA who might want to comment or maybe someone, anyone from the community who might say, you know what, I've ordered myeloid NGS, or again, this has kind of been a restricted, you know, it's not funded, we don't order it type scenario in your practice. I see so, Graham Quest. Yeah, and in Kingston, we have uh, myeloid NGS, so all of our acute leukemias get it. We have the luxury, although it's not funded, for exceptional cases where you know, we think we're looking at atypical CML, now it has a new name, uh, but in cases like that, we have the option of adding it on with pathologist triage. So we have the capability here, it's the funding that's largely lacking. That's right. So it sounds like, you know, unique special cases where you can advocate that this case really needs it for us uh, to do it. And because you have it on site, then, you know, there's some capacity to run those. I assume that's the case, Rosemary, at UHN as well. When there's exceptional cases, they can be squeezed on under, yeah. but not funded. Yeah. Is there anyone from the community? Yeah, so. Or maybe I'll ask, I'll ask Sadaf because it's the only one I recognize right now uh, on my list. Are you still there, Sadaf, from Mackenzie Health? Yes, Hubert, I'm here. So yeah. have you ever ordered myeloid NGS for any of your marrows before? No, I refer it to you basically, and uh, what I've seen first time AML diagnosis uh, with CCO funds, but other than that, outside that, no, but for experimental or uh, complicated cases, I do consult you, and sometimes UHN will do it, but it's case by case basis. That's right. So I guess in, in the community, you know, if there's a new acute loop, it's often kind of left in the hands of the, of the tertiary, tertiary CMH center. Uh, often to repeat the bone marrow and to make sure you know that the relevant tests uh, get activated. Obviously, that may sometimes uh, result in a delay. Obviously, sometimes our patients are not quite happy about, I just got a bone marrow three days ago, how come I have to get another bone marrow uh, again? Uh, I see in the chat uh, in Peterborough, we refer all heme path to Kingston. Uh, so then it goes to it goes to Graham. So I see a couple of networks there. I know I know UHN has an extensive network of referrals as well. Uh, where there may be some of this, some of this access taking place. Any other, any, anyone else uh, want to chime in? 
think we also have some people outside of Ontario. If anybody is uh, and wants to share how it's going in there. If no one's brave enough, I know, you know, just from some of the interactions, um, you know, it's not an issue in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan. I don't think it's an issue in Manitoba. I don't think it's an issue in some of the provinces in Maritime. So Ontario has actually been uh, very slow in really um, pushing this. But as I said, hopefully uh, this will change in the future. But that also identifies, you know, uh, a potential um, experience gap where you know, our community needs to start, okay, how do I interpret these? How do I order it? How do I integrate these uh, into my reports? Because for some of us at these CMH centers, we may, been, we may have been doing this for quite some time. And we also have built up some of the personal contacts with our uh, molecular labs where when, when help is needed. So I summarize here, again, I don't know if anyone's from London, but this was a non-issue for them for several years already. Myeloid NGS is, a set, is a, accessible. Uh, as our colleagues from Kingston and some other centers have said, you know, selected non-AML cases may be run at CMH centers related to cost efficiency or also clinical academic requests. Cost efficiency, I mean that, you know, it's, you have to run the chip anyway, so you might as well load it with additional samples. Uh, I mentioned, you know, some centers having uh, research funds to support clinical NGS. And then, uh, as I said at the bottom here, we also require it sometimes for non-anal cases for diagnostic clarity. Could also be for prognostication, however, almost every single prognostic score you look up has a molecular component to it. But I think I want to highlight also for lab utilization purposes, which you know may not have been fully understood, is that you know, if you if there was a center that could accommodate a couple of your cases, it's actually more cost effective uh, occasionally just to run the myeloid panel than to do single standalone tests. And that's what I refer to as the kind of hard line, uh, not funded situation. So I know, you know, we, there's always a, a pecking order in terms of how you advocate uh, for tests, even at academic centers. But, you know, again, speaking locally, and, and Jose Mario can, can you know, um, chime in, that, you know, there's a panel of standalone tests. But essentially, if you need more than two, it's actually more cost effective to run a myeloid NGS panel and to go line by line and say, we're going to do jack 2 kelar we're going to do bcr able we're going to do KIT. Um, and depending on the panel, especially if you also start talking about cytogenetics, you may also be able to kill multiple birds with one stone, if you will, on selected DNA RNA uh, based NGS panels. So I've started to kind of communicate this to my hematologist and my practice. And it was important because uh, at least here, heme path has you know, quite strong oversight over how bone marrows are managed and what's ordered off of bone marrow. But for peripheral blood, it's actually a much looser system. And right now still is like anything goes, anyone can actually just pick up a rec, uh, UHN rec, tick it off uh, and it gets done. But the, by and large, the major users are hematologists. It's important for us to reach out and educate them about, hey, you know, if you think you have suspicion for this particular entity, uh, it might be more cost effective talking to us and saying, you know what, let's just do one test. It might be answering multiple questions uh, all at once. And that's where I re relate this to like the not funded situation means that when, you know, when part of your, you know, administrative responsibility may have to do with your lab budget, the fact is that it's actually costing the hospital more to have the patient come back again, not just the hospital, but the healthcare system overall, it's a universal healthcare care system that it costs more to book the patient, to have the patient come back in for the nursing time, for the hematologist time, the cost of the bone marrow needles, right? To repeat a bone marrow again, so that we can do it, so that we can, so that we can get the DNA, for example, because it wasn't done the first time we didn't extract DNA. So again, trying to break down some of those uh, budgetary silos and something I've been working on with some of my external sites to say, you know, it, it's, it'd be nice if you had a molecular tube on hand so at least we can assist with basically what the next steps are, because even for academic centers, we may totally agree on the morphologic interpretation. But what you need basically is additional testing, but you don't even have starting material uh, to help the patient. So it's probably no surprise that a bone marrow aspirin biopsy contains many different parts. Uh, here, I want to add that, you know, this may be, you know, this may be obvious maybe at some of the CMH centers, but at a lot of CMH centers, 
protect non-CMH centers. Again, what exactly is drawn at an aspirin biopsy? Maybe at the discretion of the hematologist or medical oncologist who, this is my clinical suspicion at the time. And therefore I only drew flow. I only drew flow. I didn't think I was gonna need cyto or I didn't draw molecular. And so maybe one of the take home messages here is to start having those conversations that in my opinion, if we're, if we're gonna do a bone marrow aspirin biopsy, let's make sure that we have all the pieces uh, that we're going to need. And drawing the pieces may still require uh, some collaboration with a re referral center, exactly how, how to handle if this molecular specimen. Can we just keep it in our lab if we don't have the capacity, for example, to extract DNA? Uh, there's also an important arrow there, which is basically biobanking. Uh, basically, in complex molecular hematology, there's still a lot of research that needs to be done in order to improve the welfare of these patients. And because even drawing all these tubes at Sunnybrook was also an issue, was that uh, we came up with a universal bone marrow aspirin biopsy job aid. So this is basically all over the hospital. It's on procedure carts. It's in the hematology center. It's in the clinics to remind them, well, this is the standard draw order. This is what it's for. These are the tubes that you use. This is already pre-packaged for you, but there's also a visual reminder for you that this is what you want to do. And that every tube, every package even includes uh, a biobanking tube, so that it becomes, you know, standard practice that, you know, to talk to the patient uh, about consent and then actually having that extra material as well. We also provide our patients with uh, educational material about that six tube that I've indicated there. I should, uh, I'll be coming back to this particular uh, chart. This is from the 2022 uh, ELN guidelines that are also published in blood, but I just wanted to highlight here that biobanking is also something that's considered an additional test and is something that, you know, should be included in the care of patients referred for CMH. So here we'll see if I, we get some more um, people to chime in. And I wanted to see, again, we have different centers here. How many of these centers do you actually triage a bone marrow? Meaning, you know, in that first couple of hours when it arrives, you're already taking a look and having an idea of, okay, these are some of the tests we're gonna activate. These are the things I need to make sure uh, that we have. Or even if, oh, you know what, how come there's no molecular tube today? I need to call the clinician again and say, you know what, before the patient leaves, can you draw, can you draw some blood? So Graham, I get the thumbs up. They triage marrows there, so they're actively involved. Basically, uh, we triage every marrow in Ottawa. Hello, Phil, nice to see you uh, virtually. And Sadaf as well from McKenzie. Okay, that's actually higher than I expected. Uh, Tanya, I don't know you, but uh, what center are you from? Hi, I'm, I'm from Halifax. Okay. So yeah, we all of our marrows go under um, triage. So maybe I'll turn it back to Rosemary. I know we didn't do that back in the day. I don't think you guys are doing that now. No, not not in the way you're describing to actually kind of call back and say, um, yeah. And in the yeah. chat, we have Katie saying that at uh, PRHC, they do not have HP expertise in house to do this. Sorry, what is PRHC? At, uh, is it uh, Peter, Peterborough? Kitty, do you want to? <laughs> Sorry, yes. Yeah, so we send just sort of chiming in with the community hospital um, of course. Uh, reality. So, yeah, which is. No, it's interesting. I think these, these perspectives are, are very important because, once again, we're talking about applying new classification systems, potentially getting access to, to more technology, and again, is there, is there a way to triage? Is there a way to integrate back and how, how, this, how will this uh, fit in? And we have a yes uh, at London as well. Mm -hmm. So it's really remarkable that actually, triage actually takes place everywhere except UHN, partly mostly because I, in my opinion, it's because um, it's configured to just high volume. Uh, we will have the molecular and cytogenetics on hand in house and we'll just kind of brute force uh, ram, it, ram it through. Yeah, so I think, to be fair, they pretty much do it for every bone marrow anyway unless they can't for some technical reason so maybe that's also like they just it's just a front kind of yes exactly so it's something I, I kind of took for granted as well when I was there and then realized while working up cases that why well, there's no molecular tube you guys didn't draw one it's like no why not it's like well why would we it's like well why didn't you so 
Uh, we have Unity Health. Uh, triaging is different at St. Mike's and St. Joe's, but it happens sometimes. Uh, we are missing samples for needed tests that we didn't know we needed until later. So absolutely. So that's something that you know I, I you know I'm trying to say we should avoid, especially that you know we think that we're you know we need tools to make these diagnoses that you know should really standardize and it's again a conversation that should be led by the, led by the lab and then speak to your uh, hematologist and and medical oncologist that you know what this should be standard, including even the possibility that it's not even four tubes, it's five tubes that you should actually have two uh, for molecular. Uh, there's also lots of logistics involved in that, and there's obviously some costs involved in that as well. But again, the conversation is that at the end of the day, this actually costs the hospital less than having the patient come back again, specifically to repeat an aspirate because you needed molecular. So this is the, the process as well at Sunnybrook. We're, you know, on average within 20 minutes uh, of it arriving in the lab, uh, a hematopathologist is looking at it. It has the additional complication of, you know, as a CMH center, um, it isn't as simple as, okay, it is acute leukemia, let the clinician know, and they're on critical to see which, you know, which CMH center this patient is being referred to. So because of that, we've had to blend basically uh, a workflow of chronic type myeloid uh, issues with the fact that this is acute leukemia and this stuff should go out right away, whether and activate any standalone uh, testing that may be required. So HP is able to triage these, right? And basically during this window of time, quickly determine, okay, is this one of those surprise acute leukemias, which is kind of like cytopenia NYD. And clearly there weren't blasts in the blood, but there's definitely blasts uh, in the marrow. And to get everything started uh, and cooking, especially when you know there's those surprise APLs that tend to always happen Friday, late afternoon before the long weekend. It's also uh, a quick way to know that, you know, this aspirate doesn't look like it's going to be representative and the differential is still broad. And I'd really like to know that I have all the material that I'm going to need downstream, depending on what the biopsy looks like, depending on what IHC may look like. And these are tests that still may take another three days uh, from this initial date of the bone marrow. At the back end, though, again, this is uh, for Sunnybrook, a CMH center that also works very closely with UHN for their genomics needs is to actually get these results back and then get them back in a, in a way that can be communicated uh, to the clinicians, ideally electronically, but unfortunately it's sometimes actually not that simple to get these results uh, electronic. And unfortunately, I'd have to say that, you know, for many of these, we still actually uh, require scanning and a manual check of the transcription uh, before releasing that. In the future, I think you're also gonna find that you, a lot of cases are gonna require more and more addendums, including something we created, a special class with basically final classification that uh, has a different header, can be flagged differently uh, in, your, in your pathology software. But you know what, this was the final diagnosis after all the remaining ancillary tests had arrived. Some of the other nuances is that, okay, is this, is the karyotype best or do you think we need fish? You know, is there enough plasma cells here? Do we need plasma cell separation? Or there's multiple things here. You know, I may still need a karyotype and I need you to enrich your plasma cells. So these are all things that a hematopathologist is very well positioned uh, to interject rather than the hematologist upfront knowing what exactly uh, they might need. So it's helpful, I think, you know, since most of the group here already knows, then, you know, it's truly obvious it improves test utilization. Uh, some other bullet points here. Maybe charge, I'll go to the fourth one because I actually directly asked at a hematology retreat recently to say to the hematologist, are you enjoying this? That you know what? You don't have to fill out these requisitions. Leave them blank. We'll take care of it for you. We're going to read your click note. We can read a CBC. We'll make sure what you need is going to be ordered, or at the very least, we'll make sure that we have DNA, RNA, and fix cells. And actually, the hematologist really appreciated that because it took away that onus of them also at the bedside. Yeah, I'm going to need this form. I'm going to do this, or the dreaded. They just draw the, the line straight down the whole requisition. Because again, if you're an acute leukemia doc, what, are you not going to check off? Well, I think you should rule out 821. I think you should rule out inversion 16. Well, maybe we should take a look at what it looks like first, maybe see if it even is myeloid leukemia uh, before you start ordering all these tests. So, though well, these were published in July. If you're waiting for the final PDF, they're now available as well. Are you doing anything different right now? So, so that's a question for the group. Um, 
I, you know, have advised my group that we are probably going to be tweaking some of these things, specifically using the 10% threshold that has been proposed by the ICC, but not by WHO. Although, you know, we don't have time necessarily to debate which one, you know, is better. This really going to kind of boil down to some practicality. And to take a look at that, and so I don't shock Jose, because I've been trying to tell him for a little bit now that there's going to be a lot of cases coming, but he doesn't believe me. So I took a year's worth of bone marrows and I said, let's just plot out the blast count for every single bone marrow that we did. And it's obvious that if it was above 20%, these are the cases that we were already doing for CMH funded by CCO. If you're going to apply the 10% threshold, and that means that from 10 to 20%, uh, surprisingly, I didn't know what to expect, but again, this one year's kind of quick glance was that, okay, we have 4% additional bone marrows uh, that would require NGS. If you tweak it to say, you know what, anything with, with increased blasts, EB or IB, whichever one you're gonna subscribe to, then again, about 10% additional volume uh, would be expected and potentially couched in like an MDS slash AML uh, rationale indication. So I think these ones may not require necessarily the acute leukemia turnaround time. Although there's, I guess at UHN, there should be only one turnaround time since all of them should be supposed to be acute leukemia. But again, do we need another tier now where, you know what, these aren't the ones that were conventional 20%. These ones should be rushed, but maybe not as rushed as the whole slew of other myeloid disorders that come our way, for example, at Sunnybrook. And here we use our diagnostic synoptic to basically capture what were all the MDS, MPN, MDS, MPN cases uh, that we diagnosed? And the, the length of the rectangle roughly corresponds with basically, these were the diagnoses and these were the blast count ranges. So you can see that, you know, there were MDS and MPN presentations that did not have elevated uh, blasts, but theoretically you should be doing myeloid NGS uh, for diagnosis, but also for prognosis, whether you need driver mutations uh, or not, so on and so forth. A question mark box as a leeway that kind of brings it up to 300 cases projected is because we didn't really capture clearly in our synoptics for patients that just came with kind of cytopenia NYD because those could also be clonal cytopenia of undetermined significance or, you know, depending on what you find, maybe it is low grade MDS as well. So this is a bit of the kind of forecasting of the additional volume uh, from Sunnybrook. Gilbert. Can you comment on the expected turnaround time in acute look? Five days. Okay. Well, we'll come back to that. We'll come back that. We'll come back to that in a second because we can take a look at current CCO uh, TAT and um, what CCO may say for chronic leukemias. What is that turnaround time? Because it makes no sense that if the chronic leukemia turnaround time is actually now shorter and the acute leukemia turnaround time, that it doesn't make any sense, right? So I think that has to do with when, the, when, these, when these guidance documents are gonna be issued. The other key factor, and, and it's gonna be an upfront change in management, right? Because I think diagnosis is one thing, the logistics of managing the lab are, are one thing. The other one is upfront treatment. And again, you may have some time to make these decisions. So that factors in to what this rapid genomics turnaround time might be. But <coughs> clearly for, sorry, <coughs> for eligibility for clinical trials, for example, may be important right away to know TP53 mutation status. It itself is gonna be a different category even within the MDS and AML structures. And we may have to go old school for this, doing P53 IHC. <coughs> not to conclusively make the diagnosis that there's mutated TP53, but really as a surrogate to tell Jose that you need to light a fire under this case because we probably have like a 99% probability that TP53 is mutated. So then so again, within that tier, elevate and say, you know what, this one should be reported first. Well, these are some of the things, ideas we've been floating around to help your life, you know, to make your life smoother in case instead of just saying these are all you know, ra rapid turnaround times is required. So would you do TP53 by title or sequencing or both? 
because that's also going to change your turnaround time, Hubert. So I haven't thought that far ahead about that part, right? So I think the question here is we're talking, we're talking about, again, there's different kettles of fish here, so it's kind of hard to generalize, right? That you may need P53 quite, quite rapidly for acute leukemia. You want to know that upfront because it would also change management. And, you know, CCO actually has a quality indicator that, you know, chemo started within five days of the diagnosis. The diagnosis being the date of the marrow, not the date of the report. So that's used actually as a quality indicator for CCO. And clinicians yeah. definitely would like to know if P53 was present, right? But we can't, you know, is there, is there just a way to say, you know what, these are the cases you would want to prioritize, even if it is the current methodology, or you'd have to say, you know what, we're going to need a different methodology because we want P53 to be uh, done in five days. I should say the ELN, however, yeah. Will P53 IHC be enough in this case then? If you want to meet your five days turnaround time. So I think you're asking also pathologists then to go back to counting cells, brown dots uh, on a biopsy, which I hate, I don't know. Um, some people, like there's a nice blood paper that says that the threshold of mutated versus wild type is 7.2%. So you can try to do that on your cell counter. Um, there are other people on the uh, on the call today who are actually uh, exploring research projects uh, in this area. So I think I there's still a lot of things. I guess I'm wondering how other geneticists feel about the five days turnaround time for NGS and, and, and fish on P53 alone. I don't think that that's going to happen anytime soon, but I'm curious as to what others have to say on this. I can say I've just been, you know, there have been some clinical trials, you know, for acute leukemias. And one of the questions was, well, how quick can we randomize these patients, right? To TP53 mutated and not. And the short answer was, it will take a long time by the standard route, but if we wanted to do it faster, it would also blow the budget. So. So it's a question that's coming up and I can see the clinical relevance for it, but I can also see that, you know, if we're going to open NGS testing to a broader category of myeloid neoplasms, there has to be now some kind of triage mechanism in place. So it's clear which ones should be reported earlier, whereas which ones are really like, this is black and white MPN. I don't really need a driver mutation to make this call versus the ones, you know, versus acute leukemias, you know, we need to classify this right now to select targeted therapy. I can see in the chat that people are not excited by a 7% <laughs> I think that has been always the question about IHC interpretation. So whether it's lymphoma, cell of origin. So IHC itself is a very complicated technique. I would say that if you're going to do this, you also need adequate controls on decalcified FFPE to know that your TP53, your, your P53 IHC is working appropriately. Um, again, there's other experts who can chime in. My understanding is that the interpretation is just the overall brown stain, not necessarily related to how many lymphocytes may be present or how many blasts are actually present uh, in the material. I think pathologically, that pathobiologically doesn't seem to make sense. Like I think I should, you should want to factor in the assessment of P50 to the overexpression, the actual tumor part uh, of this biopsy. But again, that may not obviously be realistic, you know. Yeah, and I guess the question is also if it if it starts to be because of turnaround times and such used potentially by clinicians to decide what treatment they're giving, like should there be a sort of like standardization the same way they're doing for HER2 or stuff like that, um, if uh, if the management is going to be that they're going to use that before right. receiving the, the formal molecular and, you know, by the time you get the molecular, they'll have already started a certain therapy. Exactly. So there's two things there. One is we're triaging because we're trying to inform the clinician versus triaging to help molecular say these are the group, this is the amount of work that needs to go into a, you know, red stream or whatever. Right. So again, there's two different things. I've also cautioned that no, I don't think you can rely on this alone, right? To say, okay, you're going to change therapy based on this one IHC marker. So Graham. Yeah, just also to highlight the uh, the realistic problem of processing bone marrows, right? The sample's taken, it goes to the lab, it needs to be decaled, embedded, cut, it's stained. Then you need to get your TP53 stain back. Uh, you know, realistically, probably three days till you have the stain in hand and can start doing a count on it. 
at which point if uh, if they're going to hold to their guns and say a five day turnaround on molecular well it's only one more day and you'd have the definitive answer rather than my loose estimation and i guess my confidence for you know dramatically changing a treatment pathway you know what if i counted uh five percent you know brown dots on there am i sure that's not seven percent right and how do you standardize fields like absolutely. that that is a minefield and a mess absolutely absolutely uh we have a chat uh comment any ngs test needs seven days min 14 days preferred absolutely so i think you know if the upfront TP53 status is required, you know, potentially a different platform may be required, just like Health Fit 3 uh, is done separately now. Uh, but I don't want to, I think it might be a community of interest topic uh, for another day, exactly about TP53 and how we might want to address that, in in including some novel uh, methodologies uh, to do this, perhaps uh, just with uh, digital imaging. Okay, so I don't want to take up all the time, but uh, so I think I have. A, about 20 minutes left. So I have a couple of scenarios also just to kind of introduce. It's not exhaustive, but basically a few things that you know I want to share with the community about uh, myloid NGS. So scenario one is again not going in depth about you know reviewing more about you know the specific case details. But when you have a patient who's been pancytopenic, marrows have been done several times already, but you know we didn't get to a conclusion. There was not enough dysplasia, the karyotype was normal, they're back again. They're clearly pancytopenic, you know, they're macrocytic. Everything about it seems to scream MDS to you. But you look at the marrow, and instead of showing normal pictures, I show it wasn't dysplastic. So on the bottom of it, this is not what it looked like. It actually still looked kind of ho-hum. There's actually nothing really jumping out at me. It's persistent pancytopenia. The secondary causes have been worked up. The patient's now transfusion dependent. And just to make sure, you know what, I didn't miss the dysplasia. You know, you show your friends and your colleagues and everyone agrees with you. You know what, you can't, you can't confidently say there's 10, even 10% dysplasia in this, marial, in this marrow. And the karyotype, again, is normal. The blasts are not increased. Would you try to sort out, would you try to request myeloid NGS? So if you're a center that currently doesn't, would you actually maybe talk to your boss and say, hey, you know what, this patient, this is the third marrow. I think we should try to like reach out somewhere and ask if they can do this for us. Okay, well, I did, because I said, this is the third marrow. And I personally don't actually want to see the marrow again. I don't want to do this again. Let's just, let's just try to get an answer. And then when the answer comes back, it's like, wow, you know, that looks, that looks pretty bad. So again, I'm not going to do an intro into the, the different genes if you're not familiar right now. But let's just, we'll take, take my, take it at face value. It looks bad. Do you think it looks bad? Yeah, it looks bad. So the first the kind of, kind of shock I wanted to convey was that, you know, if you're introducing yourself to, again, a new kind of type of report and you want to try to integrate it, you'd say it's like, wow, you know what, like this is the third marrow and we did, you know what, we never pulled the trigger. It just didn't look dysplastic enough for us to call it morphologically. This is clearly like, you know, MDS, at least the myeloid neoplasm. And therefore, the addendum comment after signing out a descriptive thing about the patient, right, that's normal cellular, subtle dysplasia of really not 10%, you know, basically ancillary studies pending was the, is the addendum comment there uh, that really does support MDS myeloid neoplasm. And I think, again, what I want to share here was that the follow-up also supported that, you know what, this was not going to go well, and the blast did start to increase. The dysplasia became fulminant. The patient lost response to conventional MDS therapies and unfortunately expired. So those are the situations where you get the surprise bear, which is, I really didn't expect that NGS finding because that's not really the way it looked. That's not, you know, but the rest of the picture fit, the CBC fit, the clinical scenario fit. So what about, you know, a different kind of context here? And I think my, my colleagues in Kate Stanford sharing this was related to something else that I was working on as well. But again, an example would be, you know, the dreaded eosinophilia NYD workup. Probably the most, the single most expensive lab, you know, myeloid lab workup uh, required. So, okay hemoglobin, okay white count, okay platelets, elevated eosinophils. 
but there's really nothing going on in the bone marrow. It looks a little bit reactive. The standard tests that you have access to, normal karyotype, negative for eosinophilia fish. Actually, the patient's eosinophilia actually resolved after one month. And you end up getting this NGS result back. Does it look pretty bad, Jose? Yes, again, yeah. Yeah, it looks pretty bad. So it's almost like the case before, but not quite, because you know everything, everything seems to just get better. And the situation was, you know, during that day, during that clinic, there were actually two different patients. And that result actually seems to be much more fitting for someone else. And as lab medicine professionals, you know, this is something that, you know, is part of our repertoire. Wrong blood in two, when, you know, ABO, ABO result doesn't, doesn't match, delta MCVs, right? Different, you know, XY chromosomes and XX reports. And, you know, but this was a Lambda LPD before, and now it's a Kappa LPD. Like, did it really just switch? Or is this even the right patient? So, so things like that, right? So you, gotta, you wanna bring in those same basic instincts to the interpretation of the genetics. And that's also requires that kind of exposure. Bearing in mind that, yes, you know what? As in my first case, it's like, it really did not look this plastic, but everything else fits it, right? And, you know, I, I believe that, you know, those are the right results for those patients. In scenario three, again, these are just kind of rapid fire kind of situations about NGS. It's back to my, again, the bane, eosinophilia <laughs> and peripheral blood molecular utilization. If a patient has a clear kind of allergic history, a mild eosinophilia that you can even trend on connecting Ontario that fluctuates with their allergic symptomatology, no other red flags, including the clinical summary, is that his eosinophilia the likelihood that is eosinophilia is primary is low. However, we're gonna we're gonna do the royal workup anyway. So kit, eosinophilia fish, T cell clonality. And again, as I kind of emphasize with blood, uh, with blood testing, at least here, is that those just kind of get sent out and they don't really cross the hematopathologist desks. And only crossed my desk in error because the requisitions were, were delivered to the flow cytometry lab by accident. So I took a look at the CBC on the day, and actually this is the CBC. Again, no anemia, normal white count, normal platelets, trivial elevated eosinophils. I asked the hematologist, are you planning to do a marrow? And the, question, the answer was no. So what would you like to do next? How about Rosemary there? I would just like have a discussion, try to explain the, you know, the costs and suggest that perhaps if they're that concerned that a marrow should be the first step and with the appropriate samples so that we can then trigger molecular depending on the findings. So yeah, so again, it was a sample that crossed my desk in accident. So then, you know, I spoke to the hematologist and asked, you know what, can we meet halfway? Maybe we should do a blood film, even though blood films for EOs can be quite tricky, but really you're looking for like some other signs, um, which quite rule out of LPD. So because that's what you're concerned about instead of doing T cell clonality uh, on the blood. And then we're gonna bank the DNA RNA and I'm gonna meet you halfway. So I can kind of show you that if you do myeloid NGS on the blood, this is what's gonna happen. So this is the result. So is there a diagnosis? Graham, buddy. Oh, so a can of worms. You've got a clonal marker now. So do you have a clonal uh, eosinophilia? Is this a hyper eosinophilic syndrome now? Uh, you know, truly, I mean, you can see SRF2 in lymphoid things, right? It's popped up in CLL, MBL every now and then. So, you know, your flow is going to help with that. But uh, to me, I would say, oof, we've opened a can of worms and I'm not sure what to do with that result. Other Great, than a bone you. marrow, which is where we should have started. Exactly. That's what I wanted to start. And I knew it was a can of worms, but I was going to use it as an educational case. Let's see, look, 
yeah, not to perfect. do it. And I was like, look, that's why I told you. Now what were we going to do about this? So the other question was, you know, I got myself involved. So then it was like, okay, now I, now I feel compelled that I actually have to talk to the hematologist about this result because had I left it alone or if you, if, if you desire that, you know, myeloid NGS can go straight to the hematologist, then again, as a hematopathologist, you may say, well, you ordered it, you can deal with it. If you're doing it in-house or external, again, you may talk to your scientist about it. Uh, but anyway, you know, I want to continue the educational process. But basically with this patient was that the eosinophilia had fallen to approximately one, no, et no, et no etiology. Uh, fluctuating eosinophil, but there again, nothing urgent, no end organ damage. So we talked, you know, I talked about amongst the group and I said, okay, well, what do you want to do? Perfect example, what are we going to do next? Well, this is the differential we can provide you. We recommend a bone marrow, which is what we said in the first place. And the opinion of the, of the patient was that since he's feeling perfectly fine, his eosinophils are controlled. We're just going to watch until, you know, something happens. So again, that's you know, I was clear to the hematologist to say, make sure you document that this is the patient's wish, that we, we would suggest that, you know, you should probably get a marrow to sort out exactly what's going on here. Uh, but so at the end of the day, I want to hammer home, if you only do NGS once, right? Who knows what's going to happen down the road? And, you know, we may never know uh, for this particular example. But part of, because of this and kind of a lot of back and forth at our center with the hematologist and sometimes patients being referred uh, from other sample, other other places, is that we really want to emphasize to our hematologists that you know what we're doing some outside NGS right now, selected patients. We really want to do it only on bone marrows. The only time we're going to do it on blood is because it's a dry tap and there's or there's other clinical factors precluding a bone marrow biopsy. And again, for right now, where funding is not in place, if we're going to do it, we're only going to do it once. And it's a priority then to extract the most multimodal information from one time point. I always get this pushback was that, you know what, I can show you a paper that says blood is just as sensitive as the bone marrow. As I said, I never said this was about the analytical sensitivity of NGS in, uh, of blood versus bone marrow. But the counter argument also is that you're so keen about the VAF and you should have a karyotype available. And then you should probably understand what you're actually sequencing and what are actually the makeup of the different cells. So remember that either oh. WH well, in the ICC, you know, the blast percentage is still important, even in the WHO. And again, they haven't changed the way we count blasts. We still count nucleated red cell precursors, and then they sh therefore they should be factored in. The other thing I want to avoid, which I think if you provide NGS being ordered from the yeah, blood, for sure, okay, it's going you to can be go deeper. a screening test. Okay. Uh, I have a couple more slides. I just want to touch on a few things from our colleagues uh, in London who implemented myeloid NGS several years ago, also have a bone marrow uh, triage in place. I'm actually curious here, when morphologists review bone marrow aspirate, do you actually have technologists to do that or it actually requires pathologists to do? I think we might have had one person from, at least one from London, but uh, if they're not on right now, then maybe we'll hear from them uh, in the chat because potentially technologists might be able to help triage this as well uh, rather than hematopathologists. But in chatting with the, the lab director there, so I asked, you know, so who can order NGS? Limited hematologist and then standalone PCR can be ordered by internist. So it's something that, you know, we're also looking at Sunnybrook about, you know, right now it's a free for all. Anyone can order it. You know, I've seen dermatologists order NPM1, but three, I don't know, just for the fun of it. And then did he con concur with preferred sample type? And he said, and it was also, yes, we prefer bone marrow with exactly the same principle, and I should say that, you know, Dr. Chin Yi also is a hematologist, is that if you don't do that, it's going to be used as a screen for anyone with a cytopenia or a cytosis. And personally, I think that's going to be overkill. And again, it's going to lead to doing a marrow potentially, and then not being able to do it again. Um, he mentioned that he does it for chronic MPNs. We won't talk about that. I think Jose knows and, you know, have a beef about chronic MPNs where you don't have a marrow. And at this time also that they're only doing it once. So we're not clear moving forward. When are you going to repeat NGS? Uh, you have MDS and it's like, oh, it's a little bit more thrombocytopenic. It's been six months since the last one. Are you going to feel compelled again to repeat NGS? Or if the blast count went from 5% to 6% or 7%, is that something that's going to trigger you to say, okay, we're going to do it again? 
because that also factors into the, predict the projected volume. Uh, lastly, um, I, he mentioned the situation of, oh, if you do it in the NGS, you end up flying things even before the Miro. And I think, you know, Bram loves this one as well. Is that if you told me up front before I looked at the Miro that there's SF3B1, you've now compelled me to put oil on my microscope today because now I'm going to have to try to like go backwards and say, I need to explain where this SF3B1 is coming from. Is it the CLL? Is it an MBL? Is it something I can't even see? And I didn't even run the right flow panel and didn't collect enough events. Or, oh, there are rings that are glass, even though, again, certain classifications, you don't need them. But I think it still behooves us to understand, well, are you calling this SS3P1 as an explanation for the cytopenia because it actually is a myeloid issue? Or again, there's a lymphoid aggregate in that asteroid that's not even on your biopsy, so on and so forth. So I have a slew and collection of all these different really difficult where the clinical doesn't match with the morph, doesn't match with the NGS and in different combinations. So some of them have to do with JAK2 and KELAR. Uh, this plastic marrow is actually have no tier one, two variants, but then you have to be careful when you want to, you want to reach out to your molecular buddies and say, are you sure you didn't filter something out? What, you know, what did you call it as, as BUS? It's, um, and again, challenge when patients have more than one neoplasm and try to interpret variants uh, from bulk samples. Uh, so the final thing I wanted to say was that, you know, it's nice to get all this stuff and have access to it. You still need to actually rack your brain about how to get this stuff back into your report. So now that's something I think we haven't done a great job with. I don't know if other centers have, especially for external clients, is these are complicated, long reports. How do you expect me to get this back into an integrated report? Um, I, I always bring up this example. Again, this was early on when Sony Brook became a CMH center. And I was really waiting for this cytogenetic result. It's calling every day. It's like, it's signed out now. It's signed out. It's like, great, great. I can tell the hematologist to get this in the clinical record. And it was like, it took seven hours and 28 minutes to get the faxed result. And by the time the fax came, my admins had already gone home. And I couldn't get it in. I didn't even know what to do. So I walked to the ward and stuck it to the patient chart because I said, like, you know, I'm sorry, I don't know how else to like get this in here right now. And it was just for a comparison, I could have walked downtown and walked back before how long it took to get that, that fax result. Now I know I can call and tell them, can you press the manual fax button, please? Manu I want it now. Like, we make you walk to us next time if you're with. Next time, I'm, I'm gonna use a bike. Um, so this is going to segue into part two uh, for Jose. Um, we have a couple of cases. I know uh, the case that Jose uh, brings is going to talk about uh, AML. And again, for the ICC at least, there's different thresholds. The 10% MDS slash AML kind of category. I just wanted to point out that you know it's published and you can refer to that. So I'm not going to read it out right now. I set it up this way because there's so many superscripts that's like a nearly impossible chart to read, but I think it looks nicer this way, except that I don't know why they have this cross symbol here for TP53, because then it tells you to go back to this one and it has nothing to do with TP53. So I think what they meant was that you're supposed to go here, but it's disappointing when it's like, oh, you're trying to be better than WHO and you still have like typos and like still be thinking like this, or you didn't even refer the, the reader to the right place. Now you're utterly confused, but I think what they want to do is tell you to refer back uh, to this, this part over here. Um, so I think I'm going to stop there. One last comment was, again, here's the current CMH uh, CCO consensus pathology recommendations. I think they're due for revisions, partly because, you know, I don't think anyone reports CPB alpha in five days. Right, Jose? No, we do not. Um, and obviously, you know, the current cut guidelines and you have to make the diagnosis of AML. If you're using the WHO, you actually don't even need a blast count to make a diagnosis of AML. So again, it's problematic. So if some feedback may be that, you know, it's about providing the blast count and maybe the lineage within the first 48 hours and then taking a harder look again. You can compare these dates, uh, these, these timelines to basically those proposed by the 2022 ELN, which has CP alpha after the first cycle. TP53 is also after the first cycle. So that gives you more time but I do know that, you know, for some upfront, again, potentially clinical trial uh, type regimens that an earlier type would have been required. Okay, I'm just gonna go to my uh, 
sorry, last I didn't want to say that we didn't even touch on germline. I think that should be a different uh, community of interest because once you start doing more NGS, you'll be getting more and more like, is this germline? And it's like, well, maybe, but if you don't know how you're supposed to sign it out. So that's another elephant. There's actually two elephants in the room. So just getting myeloid NGS and then getting germline uh, testing. So thank you again. I work very closely with my UHN colleagues, both uh, clinically and still uh, in, in pathology. Um, I have my team here like to thank, as well as my colleagues that have helped me prepare this presentation uh, from London and Kingston. And it's 12.02, so maybe I will pass the microphone over to Josie now. Maybe while, while Jose is um, putting up his presentation, does anybody have additional questions or comments for Hubert at this point? Um, yeah, I think it'll lead to a lot of changes in the future, especially if we can, if the distinction between MBS, MBS, and AML, and AML may hinge on molecular and not purely on the blast percentage. I think it'll change practice potentially for also our community pathologist colleagues uh, in terms of what needs to be sent out for additional ancillary testing and how to integrate all of that. So I think, you know, the vision is that, you know, I think for all of our centers, um, you know, a lot of bone marrow diagnoses happen in the community. And uh, we envision that rightfully you should have access also to myeloid NGS and it'll require, again, does the, does it just stop there? You just fax the report and then, you know, that's for the hematologist and their pathologist to interpret. Uh, and it, it's a lot of other nuances there as well. And I recognize sometimes, you know, even on the, on the molecular side, right? They want to be sure, you know, are, are these real? And sometimes we can't see the clinical data. We may not be able to see the pathology data. Um, so those are just some of the, the issues to address. And I think also just to highlight again that the interpretation of these things can be so difficult, like that eosinophilia case uh, with the SRF2 mutation, is that, yeah, we consider a lot of these to be like myeloid mutations, more commonly associated with, uh, you know, CHIP, MDS, things like that. But a lot of the same mutations you can see in MBLCLL, which is nearly ubiquitous, right? Like uh, prevalence around, I don't know, 15, 20%, uh, certainly getting into the same age group. So I think as soon as you have the possibility of more than one process going on. And, you know, it's not infrequent that we do see MBL or uh, MGUS in a bone marrow along with a myeloid disorder. So, so where are those mutations? And then how do you interpret that? And that's, you know, added layers of complexity on just because you have the result, how do you mm -hmm. integrate it? And I think really only the pathologist uh, can try and combine those two things together, but it, it's complicated and it's not certain. Exactly. It's like, at least you did a CBC that day. But at 10% VAF, approximately assuming, you know, normal karyotype, 20% of these cells are carrying that, that doesn't actually seem to tie into the differential at all. So, right, uh, the, the, the flow was negative though. So there was an MBL and there wasn't a T-cell lymphoma. But again, I thought, you know, if I, you know, we spent that money, we didn't get anywhere. Um, and so I just wanted to use that as an example where I think, you know, if you talk to your med ops or your hematologist, you may get some pushbacks. Like, why, why can't we order myelin and just on the blood? Like, they just got a marrow somewhere else. You know what? I don't want to do another marrow. Again, you know you're doing another marrow. Yeah. Do you want an answer or the right answer? <laughs> well, I think it's part of us also advocating to say, you know, we want the best care for the patient. And yes, it's less invasive. And yes, it was a structural problem that, they had a bare bone marrow and there was no DNA or RNA preserved. So, uh, Larissa has a question. Larissa? Hi. Um, Hubert, you didn't even touch on this, but we did have one case where we also had a transient abnormality by NGS, or we don't even know if it was transient, but there was an abnormality picked up by NGS, and then the patient got. NGS three months later at a different institution and didn't have that variant. So those cases also pose problems for us. Yeah, and we have a, thank you. We have a comment from Sadaf in the chat because she's saying for community hospitals that McKenzie, um, they work in collaboration with Sunnybrook. 
and they collect an extra tube for molecular and will store it for a week in their fridge uh, since they don't do the extraction in-house. And then it gives them a bit of time to decide if they do need to send that sample for molecular. So, and just uh, whether that would be something other community hospitals uh, could consider doing. Again, just because now with the changes, the molecular is taking, is becoming so prominent that even certain diagnoses that before could have been done um, by morphology alone now would technically require some testing. And if I may add something, uh, especially with NGS, the quality of the specimen is also going to dictate your ability to detect certain mutation, particularly the low level ones. So this is some, just something else to keep in mind. All yeah, right, should I go? Should I go ahead? Can you guys see my slide? Yes. All right, let me know this. Thanks again for inviting me to present at this forum. Uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Jose Mario Capricici, clinical molecular geneticist at UHN, and I will be leading the second part of this conversation on the implication of ICC and WHO classification schemes on acute myeloid leukemia. So part two objectives are to compare and contrast the WHO and ICC AML classification systems. And just in the interest of time, we going to be focusing on a specific AML entity, the CBP alpha mutated AML. And I'm going to be highlighting laboratory challenges that may preclude AML subclassification using WHO and ICC. I'm not able to see the questions or comments in the chat, but feel free to interrupt me at any time. I'll monitor it too, so I'll let you know if there's a... Good, that's great. As, but before we get into this, and I think Hubert alluded to this, uh, this is our acute leukemia workflow at uh, UHN, and this is greatly in, inspired by current funding algorithms at the provincial level. So tumor samples are shared between flow, cyto, and molecular labs, uh, G bending, and where applicable fish are performed in cytogenetics, and molecular analysis consists mainly of targeted uh, PCR for rapid screening of PLE3 and PM1 mutations. And NGS myeloid uh, panel is performed as well for risk uh, stratification, diagnosis and risk stratification in AML. And this is not currently done in the five days turnaround time period. So this is our UHN hematologic NGS panel. Uh, it's a panel that targets 49 clinically relevant genes in uh, myeloid neoplasms, uh, including acute leukemia. And uh, generally speaking, we target the entire coding sequence of tumor suppressor genes. And with few exceptions, uh, we only focus on hotspot gene regions for oncogenes. And the gene that I'm, we're going to be discussing today is a transcription factor called CBPA, or commonly known as CBP-alpha. So the presence of mutation in these CBP alpha genes define a, a specific AML entity using the WHO or the ICC classification schemes. But as you can see, WHO and ICC focus on different features of uh, those this CBP alpha mutations. So for instance, with WHO, we're looking at biallelic mutation in CBP alpha, whereas we're using ICC, focusing on in-frame mutation in the BZIP domain of CBP alpha. However, irrespectively of the classification scheme applied, ML patient harboring mutations in uh, the CBP, those specific mutation in the CBP alpha gene tend to have a favorable prognosis. So CBP alpha encodes for um, a transcription factor that bind to the CCAAT motif in the promoter region of the targeted gene. This is uh, the CBP alpha is constituted of two important functional domain, the TAD domain or transactivation domain in N terminus and the BZIP domain or basic leucine zipper region in C terminus. The presence of two TAD domains in N terminus in the longer CBP alpha P42 isoform is important for normal gene transcription. And CBP alpha typically functions as a homodimer. 
and the BZIP domain is important for protein dimerization. Now the two type of mutation, two main category of mutation that are found in CBP alpha mutated AMLs. One include a loss of function mutation in the N-terminus region of the, G of the protein that tend to disrupt the TAD domain, typically the TAD1 domain, resulting in the shorter CBP alpha isoform, a P30 isoform that then inhibits uh, the wild type of longer P42 isoform, therefore, you know, a dominant negative manner and therefore reducing uh, overall gene transcription. The second type of mutation encountered in CBP alpha are in frame mutation this time in the C terminus domain of, of CBP alpha. And these will disrupt the BZIP domain, which prevents uh, protein dimerization. And the resultant effect is also a loss of gene transcription overall. So I, I know that a lot of people from the poll prefer the WHO classification system, but as, as a molecular geneticist like myself, um, Applying the ICC classification scheme to CBP alpha is actually pretty easy because I know exactly what type of mutation to expect. Uh, those are in-frame mutation. And in addition to that, I know where those mutations are located within the CBP alpha gene. In, in this case, in the B zip domain in C terminus of the gene. And in addition to that, uh, those in-frame B zip mutations account for the majority okay, of okay, mutations. Okay, okay, pour le um, alors attends, uh, je vais juste regarder Sorry. que tu sais, il y a le... Can someone mute? Uh, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so I was saying that, you know, those in-frame basic mutation also account for the majority of mutations that are detected in the C-terminal end of, of the CBP alpha protein. And as such, they're very easy to spot. So that really makes our life easier. So applying the ICC classification scheme in, in AML is, is much more easier for us. Conversely, uh, when we look at the WHO, uh, what WHO recommends um, in, in CBP alpha, so AML with biallelic CBP alpha mutations, this calls for the presence of two mutation in, in CBP alpha. And in addition to this, those two mutation must be on opposite chromosomes so in trans configuration as highlighted by the biallelic terminology. And a couple of challenges with applying the WHO classification scheme here. The first one is a technical one. Uh, most labs, as, at least to my knowledge, are performing bulk NGS short read sequencing or Sanger sequencing in some cases. And, and as such, we're not able to determine the phase of the CBP alpha mutation. In other words, I can't really tell you whether the two mutations in CBP alpha are located on the same chromosome or on different chromosomes. So that's one. The other challenges are more analytical or, or with respect to interpretation of CBP alpha mutation, because WHO doesn't really specify the location of the mutations, uh, the deleterious mutation within the CBP alpha gene. In addition to that, we don't really know the nature of the mutation that we should be looking at. And those two factors are actually very important given the lack of functional evidence for many mutations identifying the CBP alpha gene uh, in occurrence in frame and missense mutations. There also seem to be uh, a different assortment of mutations identified in CBP alpha, whether we're looking at single mutated CBP alpha cases or double mutated CBP alpha cases. So looking at CB, single mutated CBP alpha cases, there seems to be a, a predominant of loss of function mutations, so nonsense of frame shift mutation. And these things tend to cluster in the, in the end terminus uh, end of, of the protein. And one could infer that those mutations will disrupt one or both that domains in, in the P42 CBP alpha isoform. When we look at double mutated CBP alpha now, there's also a predominance of loss of function mutation in, in N terminus, but in C terminus, you tend to have a, a higher frequency of in-frame mutation and to a lesser extent, missense mutation. So in other words, uh, B-zip in-frame mutation 
are found in the majority of biallelic or double mutated CBP alpha cases, where you can also see a fewer of those uh, in frame visit mutation in uh, single mutated CBP alpha cases. The frequency of CBP alpha mutation varies depending on, on the population. Uh, at UHN, about 10% of our AML patients harbor a mutation in CBP alpha. And it's not very surprising to see that uh, that frequency is very much aligned with what is expected in the Caucasian population, given uh, the demographic of our, our catchment population. So there's several studies that have shown that um, biallelic CBP alpha, AML patients with biallelic CBP alpha mutation have a superior outcome compared to monoallelic CBP alpha or individuals that don't have any mutation in CBP alpha. And uh, in fact, biallelic CBP alpha cases tend to have a, a much better uh, a, a outcome or overall survival in this case than any other um, genotype in AML, including the other very well-known favorable uh, prognosis genotype in AML, so NPM1 mutated and FLE3 ITD wild type genotype. Now, looking at, there was another study more recently that looked at patients, individuals that have a single mutation in CBP alpha, and it tried to subclassify so this into BZIP mutation, so mutation occurring in the BZIP domain. So any type of mutation occurring in the BZIP domain versus mutation that are occurring in, in the TAD domain in N terminus. And what they showed is that cases with a, a single mutated um, BZIP uh, mutation tend to have a better outcome than patient with a single mutation in the TAD domain of, of CBP alpha. Those single mutated cases, uh, well, biallelic uh, CBP alpha cases still have a superior outcome than those single mutated cases. But when they looked at uh, all the BZIP mutations, particularly in frame mutation within the BZIP domain, what they showed was that uh, individuals with an in frame BZIP mutation in CBP alpha tend to have a superior outcome compared to any other genotype in CBP alpha, including any other type of biallelic CBP alpha combination. So, in summary, CBP alpha was our first mutation in CBP alpha in association with AML was first uh, uh, made in, in the early. 2000, and uh, very early on, people showed that, observed that CBP alpha mutation predicted a favorable outcome in AML. Couple of years later, uh, it was shown that only CBP alpha double mutation predicted a favorable outcome in AML. And then this was incorporated in the 2016 WHO guidelines where AML with mutated double mutation in CBP alpha or so-called biallelic CBP alpha was uh, identified uh, as a distinct AML entity. More recently, uh, it was shown that BZIP mutation in occurrence, uh, in frame BZIP mutation predict uh, a superior outcome in, uh, in AML. And um, these were added to the ICC to 2022 ICC guidelines, where AML, a separate AML entity with uh, in frame BZ mutation in CBP alpha was also uh, identified. So, what does it really? Uh, I've highlighted some of the challenges that we face at the molecular level with, you know, like detecting or interpreting mutation in uh, uh, CBP alpha and applying the um, ICC or WHO classification schemes. But what does it mean at, at a practical level? Um, so I, I went back and looked at all our UHN CBP alpha AML cases. And, and then when we look at C, a single mutated CBP alpha, um, I also clustered the different mutation in N-TER versus C-TER, B-ZIP, and non-B-ZIP domain. 
And what you can see here is that in the, in the enter domain, we have a, a higher pre, uh, predominance of loss of function mutation, which is in keeping with what has been described in other CDP alpha mutated cases. And then not surprisingly, when you look at double mutated CVP alpha patient, there seem to be a, a higher uh, frequency of inframe mutation in the busy domain of, of, of those biallelic or double mutated CVP alpha cases. And in N-terminus, we still have uh, the loss of function mutation. And in fact, uh, in looking at those, specifically at those double mutated CVP alpha cases, so in the inner circle, you have the inter mutations and the outer circle have the BZIP, CTER mutations. Um, so about 70% of our cases have a loss of function mutation in enter combined to an inframe BZIP mutation. So applying, uh, so those are cases, those 30 cases or 70% of our, our, our study cohort will meet the WHO and ICC criteria for uh, this you know, specific CBP alpha mutated entity. A and then uh, those will be predicted to have a favorable AML outcome. But we also identify about 30% of cases that have a different mutation in CETA of CBP alpha. So eight of them have a, a loss of function mutation in, in, in the BZIP domain. And then there were six additional cases in this case, have a, uh, a missing mutation in a busy domain. So those are cases that will still meet the WHO classification of biallelic CBP alpha, but not the ICC classification scheme. So my question to you is, is whether, so under the ICC, uh, those patients will undergo um, transplant and then under uh, WHO, they will not. I went back and looked at the diagnosis of, try to find out uh, the diagnosis of all the, those 14 patients. Unfortunately, there were six patients for which I wasn't able to find information, but I've listed the, the, uh, the final diagnosis on, on the remaining cases. I've also conducted the same exercise on other cases that we have with single mutation in CBP alpha. And then so those cases will not meet the WHO classification of, of biallelic CBP alpha, obviously. Uh, and then so all of them will, well, some of them will, will undergo uh, uh, stem cell transplantation. Um, of this patient, four happen to have uh, a, a single mutation, inframe mutation in the BZIP domain. And so under ICC, if we were to apply the ICC classification scheme, those are individuals that will not be candidate for transplantation. And uh, these are the final diagnoses uh, on those four patients. So, so really when you look at the data, uh, 30% of, we have 30% of discordant uh, diagnosis uh, in, in applying the I, uh, ICC or WHO classification scheme, looking at biallelic CBP alpha cases only. And then when you include uh, uh, the single mutated CBP alpha cases, we have uh, another 15% of cases that, that were discrepant, where uh, in, in this case, we will have four uh, CBP alpha with inframe BZIP mutation on the ICC that will not meet the WHO classification scheme. And then so I, I wonder, I know that labs are not applying, or actually I don't know if people have decided on whether they're using WHO or ICC, but I wanted to hear from from you on how, if you would have treated those patients differently and how would you, we would have approached those, those cases. Anyone on the call, Hubert, Rosemary? Well, I think it's always challenging to go retrospective, right? That though, those were the classification guidelines uh, at the time. I think you raised a really you know, important question that you know two patients were considered AML MRC, which would have been considered adverse risk uh, using the old the old system and the old ELN. 
Um, so potentially those are, you know, what we know now, they are single mutated, you know, CBP, CEBP alpha piece of mutations and they are actually favorable uh, prognosis. So I think, I think we can always do this with any classification change uh, over time that some patients will be upstaged, some patients will be, will be downstaged. Um, I didn't show the chart, but you know, the 2022 uh, ELN, you know, does clearly state, uh, again, the ELN is using the ICC system. So for, for those of us, you know, who feel also that, you know, at the end of the day, it's how we treat the patients and the hematologists, at least for AML, seem to be gravitating towards the ICC framework. Then, you know, I think my personal belief is that, you know, I gravitate also towards ICC or for AML at least. And by that definition, you know, they, they are favorable risks by, by ELN when you require transplant. I think some of the retrospective data is also difficult to interpret given all the new targeted agents and is it then becoming more of the uh, backbone, less intensive therapy. And, you know, I think that's another challenge when interpreting some of these overall survival uh, charts. So in, in light of all those changes, would you like molecular geneticists to now start flagging all the inframutations mutations in, in, in the busy domain for your knowledge? Is this something that you, you care about or? That would be one of the main messages in the report was that it would, in my opinion, would be that you flag that, you know what, there's an in-frame BZIP mutation, right? So that, you know what, it's clear, you know, it's communicated to the hematopathologist, it's also clear to the hematologist and that as currently constructed, that supersedes anything else in the ICC. There are superscripts about, you know, we don't know if you have ASXL1 and SRSF2 as well as that BZIP, muta BZIP mutation. Does that change the prognosis or not? So that's acknowledged in the ELN that for the time being, it doesn't change, but we're not actually sure. So again, you know, it's, it's easy to focus on one thing, but uh, you might find that, you know, there are, there are other factors that's, that are going to affect whether the, the patient responds to, to chemotherapy. We had a thumbs up for from Graham. So uh, just, just to say as well, I guess. Oh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, that you know we had the similar thing happen with uh, NPM one in the last version of the WHO, right? Where before, if you had you know significant displays, yeah, oh, it was myelodysplasia related to change, and then it flipped to say, oh, but if it's NPM one, actually you discount the myelodysplasia, and this is just NPM one that's back to being favorable. So this kind of switch in between versions, like. Every single time, there's going to be massive changes to a subset of patients, and this is another great example. Right. Yeah, I agree. And, and in practically speaking, when it comes to biallelic CVP alpha, um, those 14 cases, would you consider them to be to fall within this biallelic CVP alpha category, since they have a different type of mutation in the CTER domain? I, I, in looking at the, the final diagnosis, I saw that, you know, at least a couple of cases, four cases here were not labeled as CBP alpha mutated AML. Is it something that, you know, do you treat them differently? What other factors do you take in consideration? You said yourself that you couldn't prove technically that they're actually pileated. But the same rationale applied to the four other CBP alpha mutated by uh, cases, right? Those were still identified as Myelitic CDP alpha AML. So why would you treat the 14 orders differently or do you? Well, I guess a question for the one you're talking about in the bottom there would be, so you have an enter and you have a CTER, but it's not an in-frame BZIP. So Correct. it doesn't meet ICC criteria to call this BZIP in-frame CDP alpha AML. So it doesn't go into that category. So I guess what the you, question becomes, do you- Sorry, but it does mean Sorry to interrupt you, but it does meet the WHO classification scheme, though, we, because you have two mutations in CBP alpha uh, at opposite end of the protein. Uh, yeah, I guess what I'm saying is that you know, if you have you know, as a clinical pathology you know group, where there's an understanding that the ICC is basically being adhered to, you may comment in your report that theoretically this meets WHO criteria for biallelic CBP alpha. However, that's not actually recognized by the ELN risk classification. I think another question, I don't know if you're coming, you probably have some more slides, but then, you know, there's also that germline question. 
Correct, and this is something that I didn't touch on, but typically uh, in biallelic CBP alpha, a mutated CBP alpha, the end terminal mutation, typically loss of function mutation is the one that uh, occurs in, in the germline context. So um, germline testing, I guess, will be warranted in all the biallelic CBP alpha cases, whereas in the, in the in-frame basic one, you wouldn't really, have any need for it, uh, except if you see this in, in combination with another uh, uh, CBP alpha mutation. And I, I have another two other cases, potential scenarios, I'm just trying to move to the next slide. So those are two other uh, potential scenarios where we we'll have a discrepancy in applying the WHO or ICC classification scheme. So here we have a patient, and this is a real patient from your uh, with a CBP alpha visit mutation at the valve close to 100% with 20% blast. So one could ask whether this is a single or double visit mutation. I guess in this case, it doesn't really matter because you still have a you know, a, a basic mutation, but would you force the biallelic WHO uh, CDP alpha classification in, in this case? Because you still have, you could think that this, you know, you may think that those are two mutation, a BZIP in enter and a BZIP in CTER, because, you know, you have 20% blast and the valve is close to 100%. How would you treat this this, this case? What's and the, it's almost a, uh, sorry, what's the cytogenetic for that? Normal karyotype. Nothing on chromosome 19, so you can't really think of an LOH or something like that. So those are things that could happen. I didn't look at the valve for all the other variants, but I, I spotted this one. And then another possibility is to have, uh, it's, you know, I, I made this one up, but you could have a different type of inframutation in enter with the same, you know, in, in, in another inframutation in CTER as well. So in this case, you, you know, you, you, you kind of going back to the same situation where if you were to apply the WHO classification scheme, you don't really, this patient will not be uh, eligible for transplant, whereas under ICC, uh, you know, he will be uh, thought to believe to have a favorable prognosis and then therefore not be eligible for transplant. And those are different, you know, case scenario that, that we may encounter now with, with, you know, ICC coming into play. I think it's difficult to know. Uh, I'm was still thinking about the top scenario, but it would sound like with only 20% blasts that the pathobiology of this myeloid neoplasm is that it still has differentiation capacity, uh, that it is in a homozygous state, but it is able to differentiate still. And therefore, that, that's what gives you this kind of discrepancy between the VAF and the actual uh, primitive stem cell population. So what will be your final diagnosis in the, in, in, in the first case? Because this is going to happen soon or like more often as, as we move to this new era. So at 20% blast, you're, you can call it AML and the clinicians will be happy with that. And your pharmacists will be happy with that too because that opens up uh, lots of funding to be available. But would you transplant the patient or not? Oh. The transplant decision is a, is a clinical decision. There's actually a lot of other things that actually go into play, you know, like their comorbidities, so on and so forth. So I think, you know, at the very end of the day, uh, I think this just is a BZIP in frame mutated CUPD alpha AML. And yeah, that's where I would probably put it. Yeah, and regarding the transplant decision, I'd, you know, back up to say that this, both of these are great cases to look at germline, right, which would be dramatically uh, transformative for your consideration of transplantation eligibility, right, as a favorable risk, not first line, unless it's germline, in which case, uh, you know, that obviously changes the game. So none of those cases would be, I, I, I guess, at least on what I know about CVP alpha in the germline context, 
those patients will not have a germline mutation because they don't have a truncated mutation in enter. Right, that's what the literature says. So germline testing won't, won't really change anything in this case. Um, you start with you know, a visit mutation in CTER and then that's what you have to deal with. Yep, these are new frontiers. Again, I don't know how much uh, germline testing you guys are doing now in Kingston, uh, but you know, there's always been these kind of emergencies where you know, four weeks after AML, we've got you know, variants strongly supporting germline. We only have a related donor. So what do you want to do about it now? Yeah, it's very complicated. Um, so I don't know if people have a, any other question or comments on, on, on this section of the, of the discussion. If not, I know that there are two other cases that needed to be presented today. So I'm just going to end here and then thank everyone for, for the opportunity again for presenting. Yeah. Thank you, Jose. I don't know if anybody had, uh, I don't see anything in the chat, but if anyone wanted before we move on to the case presentations, if anyone had comments, questions, suggestions, uh, I think it's just, it's very interesting and it just highlights that there's a lot of complexity. And I think it brings us back to some of Hubert's points about the triage, but also about the integration, because if now you know, you have something you would have called an MDS with excess blast, but you send out for molecular and you have one of those mutations that that changes and bumps it to AML or those new MDS AML classifications. Uh, for, you know, if I have a question about an NGS report, it's easy for me. I just go knock on the door of Jose or one of our other geneticists. But if you are um, in a community center and you're sent out for that case, how, like, how can we make sure that people have that that ability to discuss like the nitty gritty of all those molecular subtleties and how to integrate it. So I think it'll change some of how we practice and just uh, we'll need to be able to, uh, to collaborate effectively and have more kind of multidisciplinary discussions. We could put Jose's phone number in the chat. <laughs> Not on Friday afternoons, but something else that we, we forgot to mention here is that at, at least at a provincial level, I, I think different labs are, do, are using different NGS panels and that will also change, uh, you know, like your mutation profiling down the road. So something else to keep in mind. Thanks everyone again for the opportunity. I'm just gonna stop sharing and then let someone else have the floor. Thank you. So we had a case presentation by Alexandra. I think you can go first. Are you able to share your screen? Alexandra, you should be able to. And I don't know how to put on my camera, but I guess that doesn't matter. So hi, my name is Dr. Alexandra Paliga. I'm speaking from the Ottawa Hospital. I'm a pathologist here. I did a five-year AP um, residency here in Ottawa. Then I went to Portland, Oregon for a hematopathology fellowship. And uh, now I'm back in Ottawa and I sign up both uh, lymphoma and uh, gynae pathology. And so the first case, uh, we're, go we're gonna only do two cases and hopefully they'll be quick. The first one is a 22 year old male who presented with an enlarged inguinal mass and there was no previous history of illness or malignancy. So he was otherwise well, and they surprisingly and luckily went straight to an excisional biopsy. And so this was the low power view of the excisional biopsy. This is the lowest I can get on my, my, uh, my camera, on my microscope. Uh, but as you can see, there are really irregular shaped, odd shaped, follicles or things that look like follicles at this power. And, you know, there's a suggestion of tingible body macrophages. And since uh, reactive germinal centers usually have a more zigzaggy, crazy appearance than uh, follicular lymphoma, you could on initial, uh, on a quick look, uh, think that this is a reactive lymph node. Um, but the germinal centers are getting crowded and funny looking. Uh, and so we'll take a closer look. 
And indeed on higher inspection, it doesn't look like a typical germinal center. You have, you do have the tangible body macrophages, but all the cells in the background seem rather monotonous. They're sort of a, like medium sized round lymphocytes with that clearing around them. And then there's a few scattered, larger, more typical central blastic cells. So a very odd appearance um, for a typical germinal center. Um, and since the cells are monotonous and uh, medium sized, you might even consider blasts. Um, so if we were to compare a typical germinal center from a reactive lymph node on the left side here, so that's, I, I just took a reactive germinal center I had on my desk and that's what they look like. You can see lots of centrocytes in there. Well, this germinal center had no centrocytes. So we sw switched to stains and so our CD20 that day was pretty dirty, but it does highlight the uh, follicles slash the follicles and there's very few T cells in the follicles, which is important thing to note when you're going to be comparing the BCL2 uh, because as we know, T cells are often BCL2 positive. So here it should be pretty easy to interpret the BCL2 because there's very few T cells in the follicles. Follicles are positive for CD10, BCL6 positive, so germinal center, normal phenotype. MUM1 is negative in the follicles and just seems to catch some plasma cells in the interfollicular areas. And then KI67 is very elevated in the follicles. And then the BCL2 was dim variable. So again, we compared to the CD3 and we went high power on the, you know, the follicles and those like monotonous cells are like variably positive for uh, BCL2. So what's our differential diagnosis? Or like what's our you favorite should see diagnosis? The whole, yeah. I guess, Sorry. yeah. You'd have, some of these would be in your differential, but given the clinical presentation, what should you be, you know, making sure you exclude or think about? So that's pretty good. So we have a wide differential, uh, which is nice. So right off the bat, um, follicular based on the morphology um, would, sorry, saying a reactive lymph node based on the morphology uh, would be a mistake because as I showed the normal versus this case, the morphology is clearly atypical. Uh, in the germinal centers slash follicles. And I can't move my PowerPoint forward. Oh, there we go. So, um, but if you wanted extra reassurance, we did have flow cytometry and the flow cytometry confirmed that all the CD10 positive B cells are clonal and DIM lambda restricted. Um, the case was sent for fish testing with break apart probes. And um, semic translocation was absent. BCL2 translocation was absent, um, which goes against follicular lymphoma, uh, especially follicular lymphoma uh, 1, 2, and 3A uh, very frequently would have a BCL2 translocation. Um, the higher grade ones might not, um, and BCL2 negative ones wouldn't necessarily, but. Anyways, and then BCL6 translocation is absent. And then whole body imaging shows no other sites of disease other than this inguinal lymph node. So the diagnosis at this point was uh, pediatric type follicular lymphoma. Uh, the lack of translocations helps exclude uh, the idea that this is a follicular lymphoma 3B, which on morphology was my main consideration. Um, the other fact that the patient is 22 years old is young and he has localized disease also points to pediatric type follicular lymphoma. And so I just um, 
I also, because this was my first time making the diagnosis, I did send it to NIH uh, for some hand holding, and they agreed with me that it was pediatric type follicular lymphoma. Um, and so I just wanted to remind everyone um, that pediatric follicular type lymphoma is a diagnostic category in the WHO. It was first introduced in 2016. And uh, despite the name, you can see it in adults, um, even up to 60 years old. So you should always think about it when you uh, have follicular lymphoma 3B in your differential. Um, and especially if uh, disease is limited to one lymph node um, in the body. Um, so these can be cured by excision alone. So these patient will, these patients will avoid RCHOP uh, if you make the correct diagnosis. So it's an important diagnosis to make. Um, and they do excellent with uh, just uh, excision. Um, they have 100% survival versus if there is a BCL gene rearrangement or it is a true follicular lymphoma, they do much more poorly. And so just to review the diagnostic criteria, there has to be at least partial effacement of the nodal architecture, which was difficult to show with, this case, uh, with my microscope. Um, there has to be pure follicular proliferation. The follicles are expansile. And you can have, there's two types of morphology. Um, here in this table, it says one, but there's these intermediate sized so-called blastoid cells. And I feel, you know, I don't have a good picture from the book, but I feel like mine were close enough. Um, and then the immunohistochemistry, typically BCL2 is negative, but it can be weakly positive. Um, the proliferation rate should be high and uh, there should be no BCL2, BCL6, IFR4 rearrangement and no BCL2 amplification. So your clue for an IRF4 rearrangement would be the MUM1 would be positive um, and which in this case it should be negative. And the disease has to be nodal, it can't be extranodal, um, it has to be low stage disease and the patients are typically young, but that less than 40, but that is not required. And they're marked most often male. Any questions about that case? Uh, so I have a question from Serge saying, thank you for the interesting case. Why did you do molecular study and was Eber done? Sorry, why did we do molecular study? Yes. Like the fish testing? I, on, on the search, do you want to expand? Yeah, he says yes. Oh, so I did it because I opened up the WHO uh, and uh, it suggested that to make a diagnosis of pediatric lymphoma, you have to exclude the BCL2, BCL6, and the CMIC. And so, and since we have that available, I ordered it. Yeah, for completeness of the yeah. workup. Yeah, I guess I could have been uh, more cowboy and just gone on morphology and the clinical, but it, I haven't made this diagnosis before, so. I do not see any other questions for now. Okay, so this one's more um, of a kind of discussion one. Um, so this was a six-year-old female and she presented with extensive lymphadenopathy on the right side of the neck. This was the core needle biopsy. And the morphology was funny. It wasn't the typical centroblastic uh, diffuse large B cell lymphoma, um, but it wasn't like burkety either. And then, you know, I considered like, is this blastic? I don't really see the nucleoli, but the cells were very like pleomorphic and overlapping. So not that good for blastic for me, but I did do a TDT and it was negative. Um, and by flow, the cells did land in the lymphocyte gate and um, they were positive for 19, 10 and 20, uh, but we couldn't figure out if they were kappa or lambda. They weren't negative for kappa and lambda, but they were sort of falling on the axis for our light chain analysis. Um, so immunophenotyping showed that the cells were, C, like, or we already know they're CD20, CD10 positive, 
but they were also strongly MUM1 positive and they're BCL6 positive and there's no FDC networks. So this is a diffuse proliferation and they're BCL2 positive. And KI67 was brisk and high. The other thing I didn't really highlight when looking at the morphology was that there were quite a few mitoses that could be easily picked out if you looked uh, closely. And there was a lot of apoptotic bodies. So you did get the sense that this was a highly proliferative thing. And so differential diagnosis for this case, um, I do have a, a like, favorite differential or what would you be thinking? Question here. Uh, Rosemary, do we have the quiz or? Yeah, it's uh, it's on. It's oh, there it is. Okay. Polling, I can. Uh, yeah. Sure. So I was just giving like a moment for people to decide, but uh, yeah, I can. Let's. Yeah. So yeah, that's a good, uh, great differential. Um, so we all agree it's not reactive. Uh, regarding diffuse follicular lymphoma, uh, you could consider it. Uh, I excluded it uh, because of the presence of the mitoses and um, the apoptotic bodies and the high proliferation rate by KI67. Folic diffuse follicular lymphoma, by definition, has to be a low-grade lymphoma. So if you have high-grade features, you should be very careful making that diagnosis. Um, and then the other pediatric we kind of reviewed, so the MUM1 positivity in the picture kind of uh, excludes it. Um, but yes, diffuse large B cell lymphoma NOS is in the differential. I thought of IGF4 large B cell lymphoma because of the head and neck region being involved. And uh, the combination of strong CD10, BCL6, and MUM1 in the head and neck region is supposed to trigger you to think of it because being strongly triple positive is uh, rare. And so when you see it, you should just oh, look at the imaging and uh, see what the disease, how it's uh, vocalized. Um, and then high grade B cell lymphoma with translocations also uh, is always a possibility whenever you're dealing with an aggressive B cell lymphoma. And so I sent it for IGF-4 uh, mutations and it did come back positive. Um, and this is the first one I've sent. Um, I sent it uh, to Mayo. I'm not sure where other people send it, uh, but it came back within a week. So I was happy with the turnaround time. And our CMIC in-house was negative. But unfortunately, we had a problem with the tissue cutting. So the first 10 slides we sent were too thick and they couldn't interpret um, the probes. So then we had to cut it into the tissue even more and we eventually ran out of tissue. So we couldn't assess for BCL2 and BCL6. And so in the end, um, so let's talk, actually let's talk about large B-cell lymphoma with IRF4 rearrangement. So it's been upgraded in the new iteration of the WHO to a definite entity. And it's more common in children and young adults um, than older individuals. And you must perform FISH uh, for the diagnosis. But uh, IRF4 rearrangement is not specific for this entity. So it can be seen in other aggressive lymphomas. Um, so if you do have a BCL2 or MIC rearrangement, it uh, then you have to think of diffuse large B or a high grade B. Um, and it often has localized disease. So your trigger stains to think of, I, of ordering IRF4 are if you have a, something that looks like a high grade follicular lymphoma or a diffuse uh, large B cell lymphoma, if it's staining for CD10, BCL6, and MUM1, and the disease is like located in the head and neck region, um, like typically Wall Dyer's ring, then you should think about ordering IGF-4 um, and all the other translocations as well. Um, 
So in the end, this case was uncertain because we couldn't figure out the, you know, if the BCL2 positive or not. Um, and so it was just left open-ended. And right now, as far as I know, it doesn't matter for treatment. I, they're gonna treat, I feel like at our institution, they get six cycles of our chop. Uh, I think it's more just going forward for research purposes uh, to document. It's my understanding. I don't know how other people feel in Toronto. Is there anyone that wants to go ahead with questions or comments or? I guess it's hard to just uh, just with the picture. Would you have gone with the LBCL or would you have considered like high grades? So high grade B. And, so yeah, I was thinking that because whenever I think of blasts, I think of the high grade B NOS uh, picture, but they weren't like round and mon monotonous enough. Like when you read the definition in the WHO, and um, yeah, and then in our institution, they don't really know what to do with that diagnosis. Um, yeah. So I, I let it alone, but it did cross my mind. Because I guess you do have the IRF4. So what you want to exclude is that there's a translocation that would take sort of precedence. Yeah, like if there was a BCL2 or a BCL6 translocation, then it's just a deal BCL. Because 14, I think it's like 14% of- Oh, sorry, yeah, Mick, Mick was negative. Yeah, sorry, I, I forgot. Yeah. yeah, you were able to do the Mick. So no, for, yeah, I, I forgot that part. Yeah, great. So did anyone, like we are pretty much at time. So it, it, does that, anybody has questions, comments, or uh, anything they <laughs> want to share? Um, I think Jenny will post the link to the post-session survey. And uh, I think you have to fill out the survey to get your CME um, certificate. And um, Please, uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, still kind of in the early days of this community of interest. So we really want to um, adjust based on your comments. So uh, let us know what you thought of uh, the format today. And um, uh, we were thinking of perhaps having a uh, next session uh, talk about the implication of the WHO ICC for the lymphoid uh, entities, but um, we will, uh, adjust based on the comments that we'll get on this session. Thank you, Alexandra, for the key presentations. And thank you to Hubert and Jose for uh, interesting presentations. Thanks for having us. Thanks, bye. Bye.